Welcome back to the Brahmin Word, and we are traveling back in time, actually, to the very first book of the Bible, uh, to the book of Genesis. And I thought what would be really, really cool is to go through the life of Abraham, who is such this huge figure in biblical history that I thought it's a great time to do that because like Samson and like Gideon, which we've gone through before, he's one of those guys that you remember parts of, but other parts you just don't recall, which is totally normal. There's a lot about Abraham in the Bible. But I think when you do a deep dive, you see, yes, the strengths of Abraham, his his loyalty to the Lord, his faith, uh, but then you see weaknesses as well. And some that are, that make you go, oh my goodness, Abraham did that? Um, but that makes his being mentioned in the book of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 even more, um, just more encouraging for you and I as we walk through our faith in everyday life. So with that, turn with me, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So first off... You may be thinking to yourself, well, who's Abram? <laughs> Abram and Abraham are the same person. Uh, Abraham is the name that God gives to Abram later on. Uh, we'll get to that later and the significance of that and what those what that name change signifies. Uh, but for here, they are the same person. Uh, but verses 1 through 3 if you just start here, it doesn't give you the full picture of Abram uh, or Abraham, right? And so if you want to turn a little bit back, we're going to go to the chapter prior, uh, chapter 11, go to verse 26, Genesis eleven twenty-six. So when Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So Terah is Abraham's father, uh, but Abram is also the oldest, I think, the oldest of three sons. Um, why do I think that? Because his name is mentioned first, um, and it's pretty typical to see that in ancient Near Eastern uh, uh, genealogies where you have the firstborn mentioned first, right? And so that makes a lot of sense. Uh, could it be that he's mentioned first because he is the most talked about out of this family? Possibly, but I think it's more likely that Abram is the firstborn. He is the oldest of these boys. So verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. So Lot is another big name that is uh, is tied to Abraham, um, and for good reason. Not only is Lot Abraham's nephew, but Lot's father, or Abraham's youngest brother, um, dies. And so it makes sense, by the way, if Abraham was... Haran's oldest brother, that he would oversee or become like a father to Haran's son uh, being Lot. Um, so I, I think that's kind of another way that we can see Abram being the oldest. But Lot becomes, in a sense, kind of like Abram's son. Uh, but it's not his biological son. Um it's he becomes like a son, like an adoption, possibly. But is he the biological son? Not really. And is he really adopted? Not necessarily when we think of adoption, but more a cultural adoption kind of deal. Um, verse 29. And Abraham and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. 
Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. So Sarai uh, gets her name changed to Sarah. Um, and that is, again, later on. We'll talk about the uh, significance of that uh, later on. Uh, but the big thing about Sarai is, is that she is barren. She had no child. And for a long time, she doesn't have a child. Uh, we're about to see here how old Abraham is when he leaves his father at the request of the Lord. Um, but for a long time, she has no children uh, and doesn't look like she will have a child because of how old um, she is at the at the time. And so because of that, um, yeah, I mean, it, it in the ancient Near Eastern culture, if you are a woman, the biggest thing, uh, if you are a married woman, the biggest thing um, that was really, really valued was passing on um, your legacy and your husband's legacy to your children. That is a huge, huge thing in this culture at this time of Abraham. And to not be able to do that is a it must have caused Sarai a lot of pain, a lot of bitterness, a lot of uh, grief, and and a lot of shame as well. Um, thankfully, we see Abraham be um, a, a very good husband. He doesn't leave her. He doesn't abandon her uh, just because she is barren. Uh, but for us, knowing that Rachel... Coming up later in the book of Genesis, Rachel, uh, the great, well, sorry, the granddaughter-in-law, I guess you could call her, uh, but she marries Jacob, which is Abraham's grandson. Um, she is barren, and yet she is gives birth to Joseph and to Benjamin. And then obviously we know that Sarai eventually gives birth to Isaac. So we know how the story ends, but in the meantime, you got to realize this is a very big deal. and It's very hard to take as it is. Verse 31, Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Quran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Quran. So that gives us a background. But what's interesting about this background is that there's no mention of the Lord. There's no mention of Yahweh at all. So when Yahweh comes to Abram with this promise to give him a country and to give him offspring, knowing that his wife is barren, uh, um, he could very easily said, I don't know who you are. This is a strange voice that's talking to me. Oh my goodness. He could have easily had said that, but he trusts and believes in God. And from what I can tell, it's not because he's a follower of Yahweh before this. I think he was a pagan uh, that is converted uh, or quote unquote saved by Yahweh. So verse four. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot with, went, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Quran. This is a big statement here in verse 4. Not only does he not hesitate, not only does he not say anything, but he just goes. He does it. He goes right away. Now you could say, well, what does he have to lose? His wife is barren. He might as well try. Yes, but he has a lot to lose because he's leaving um, his family behind. And that is a big, big risk. And so he's taking a lot of risk here, uh, but so is the rest of the family too. And he packs everything. Look at verse 5. And Abram took his Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Quran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Moray. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So he takes everything with him. He is completely given into uh, this request by the Lord. Not only that, but he goes and finds out that this land that the Lord is promising is 
is not open for business. It actually has uh, people already settled there. And so it makes you wonder again, what am I going to do? And that's when the Lord reappears uh, to Abram. Uh, verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So he again, he again says they will give him this land, even though it looks like there's it's not open for business. But then he also says, To your offspring, knowing that Sarai is barren. That is a huge statement. Um, and part of it makes you go, Oh, well, it makes sense because of everything that the Lord does. Again, this is coming, this is to a guy that has just met the Lord, has no further, has no past with the Lord. His father doesn't know the Lord. Probably his grandfather doesn't know the Lord. And so this is totally new. You can't just make that assumption just because we know about Isaac that is going to be later on, that's going to grow into the country of Israel, right? This is a big ask. And yet Abraham not only does it, but he worships the Lord at this moment when it says, so he built there an altar to the Lord. Verse eight, from there, he moved to the whole country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. So, not only does he worship the Lord once, but he does it a second time. Uh, and as he's journeying on to see where the Lord is going to send him exactly. Um, so it, it, this is a wonderful, wonderful place to start. Uh, just the strength of Abraham, his his uh, his faith, his just not knowing anything about the Lord beforehand, and yet just from a few sentences coming from the mouth of the Lord, he said, not only will I go, but I will take my family and I will take my possessions and go, even though I am 75 years old and my wife is 65 years old and she is barren, so therefore probably never going to have kids. And I'm going to go anyways, because the Lord has promised us this. Uh, and we're going to continue to see that. Uh, however, next time on Thursday, we are going to see a little bit of weakness pop up um, pretty early on for Abram and see what what that is about. So with that, I hope uh, to see you on Thursday uh, for the Brahmin Word. However, I'll see you tomorrow for the Brahmin Word uh, as well. Thanks.